It is estimated that as many as one in 10 Americans may be gay. In recent years, because of gay activism, the AIDS epidemic, and the controversy over homosexuals in the military, we're gaining a better sense of how gay men and women feel about their lives. But that was not always the case. And now a new book provides a history of the largely unacknowledged and unrecorded voices of gay Americans. It's called Making History, The Struggle for Gay and Lesbian Equal Rights, 1945 to 1990. And its author, Eric Marcus, is joining us. Good to have you here. Good morning, Charlie. This is going to sound like a strange question, but I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And I was totally unaware, I guess, that that segment of society existed. And my question is, when did I become aware? Because I'm not really sure when I did. You probably began, you probably became aware in the 1960s when the press started paying attention uh, in a broader way to gay and lesbian issues. Not in a positive way, but in a broader way. Was there some sort of trigger? There was, there, was, there was a riot in 1969 here in New York City at the Stonewall Inn, and it was the first very visible, violent confrontation between police and gay people. And what always amazes me is that this didn't happen earlier, given the times. But I think that shows how frightened gay people were of being exposed. Uh, I was conscious of the Stonewall riots when they occurred, mm -hmm. but, but was that really such a signal event? Did it really change attitudes? Did it make... Uh, all of society aware of what was going on? It didn't change attitudes and it didn't make all of society aware. What it did is it made gay people aware that it was possible to challenge the police. But I've got to point out that the uh, struggle for gay and lesbian equal rights began decades before and that there were earlier confrontations between police and gay people. But it generally wasn't reported on. Uh, this happened in New York City. It was very violent. Uh, it lasted for more than a day. It couldn't be ignored. Uh, it went out on wire services all over the world. Uh, so for, for, for heterosexual people, it gave them an indication that there were, there were gay people out there. You, you talked, uh, a large part of this is uh, your conversations with people who um, who tolerated or had to uh, absorb conditions in society in the 40s and, and 50s. What was life like for them? What did you find when you talked to them? The most remarkable story for me actually goes back to 1919. A guy named Paul Phillips, uh, now in his mid-80s, a black man, would not let me use his real name in this book. Uh, in 19 still. still, he's afraid. I said, Paul, everyone's dead. They don't know you anymore. Uh, well, and those who knew you were dead, and he was so afraid of, 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 that his family name would be harmed by people knowing about him. Mm -hmm. But in 1919, his parents sent him to the Mayo Clinic. He and his mom drove to the Mayo Clinic for a diagnosis. They thought he might be a homosexual. Uh, and first of all, what, what stunned me, and perhaps I'm naive, they couldn't stay at hotels along the way or eat in restaurants because they were black. They were a middle-class family. His dad was a lawyer. At the clinic, he went for two days of tests, and he was diagnosed as homosexual and told, we should incarcerate you. Now, I think they were only trying to frighten him, but they scared the, the living daylights out of him. Uh, well, that's interesting. You, you use the word diagnosed because yes. for a long time it, it was considered an illness. Until the early 1970s. Right. It was officially an illness, uh, according to the American Psychiatric Association. So Paul uh, was told that he was a homosexual and was afraid all the way home, back to his hometown, that he would be thrown out by his father because he was adopted. But when he got home and told his father what the diagnosis was, his father said, I don't understand it, but I don't want you out on the streets getting in trouble. Find someone you can love and bring him home. And this was in 1919. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, an, that's an amazing kind of reaction because very few people got that uh, reaction in those days. More than, more than we'd guess. Uh, but life was extremely difficult for people at that time. There was no, you couldn't dial for, uh, local telephone information and call uh, parents and friends of lesbians and gays and get advice on how to deal with your parents. You couldn't get a number like that until the 1970s. That change in designation that you talked about, 1970... 19, 1973, 74, 75. When yeah. it was declassified, in effect, as an, as an illness, when homosexuality changed in its, in its nature. And that, has it really changed attitudes? Does, does, ha, have attitudes in straight society really changed? They have. Not as much as, as many of us would like, but they have changed dramatically. The, di what, what, the big change with, with the listing of homosexuality and illness is that people can no longer say, well, you're sick, we don't hire sick people. I mean, the church could, used to say gay people are sick. They didn't have to deal with the moral, morality issue. Now the church says gay people are immoral. That point can be argued. You can't argue the point when, when doctors say you're sick. Uh, and it's very hard to go through life believing that you're a sick person. So it lifted an incredible burden from gay and lesbian people all across the country. There, there's so much more that you cover in here. You talk about, uh, obviously, what AIDS has, uh, effect it has had, uh, the present fight, uh, gays in the military. But overall, your sense, having talked to so many people who have been involved in so many aspects of this now. My overall... Uh, what struck me most is, is the, the sorrow, the anger. Uh, I talked to these people and said, these were very courageous things you did, especially in the 40s and 50s. Uh, 
And they said it wasn't courage, it wasn't guts. We were angry. They lost their jobs, they lost their relationships, their lives were ruined. And they were angry, and they weren't going to let this happen to somebody else. And that's what motivated these people. They're real heroes, uh, and they're living, breathing people. These aren't, aren't statistics, these aren't numbers. These are real people who have families, lives, and all kinds of, of emotions. Eric Marcus, good to have you here. The book, again, is Making History the Struggle for Gay and Lesbian Equal Rights, 1945 to 1990. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Charlie.